Okay, okay. we are ready when you are, sir. Okay. Welcome to another edition of Footstock. The show of Jesus. Fucking hell, have you? Welcome to another edition of Footstock. I forgot what I want to say. Welcome to another edition of Footstock. <laughs> what the fuck? Let me discuss all things FIFA Ultimate Team. That's all I say, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. It's only been a week. I know, yeah. Welcome to another edition of Footstock. I'm thinking about it too much now. Welcome to another edition of Footstock, where we discuss all things FIFA Ultimate Team. I am Matt Aguilera. And I am Matt Metzler. No. Oh, he just dabbed filthy animal. <laughs> oh, that was just scummy. Right. I don't know what more to say about that. Done, the show's over me. Press your stop button. It's all, it's all, that's it. It's all done. Right. We need to start with a serious message. This is the 10th episode, so we should be celebrating. But the, uh, the events at Chapo Quenza, which I hope I'm saying correctly, or at least in the right vicinity, obviously means that we'll be talking about that. And EA made a grand gesture that we think is a really good thing. And of course, it's not all doom and gloom. Hopefully, you haven't come here to talk about a cry about football, have you? You've come to actually be entertained. We're here to talk about Black Friday, a, a pro sighting that we have thanks to one of our loyal listeners, so Dunkle Vol for that, and our favourite informers of the season, Impact Subs Diagnosis Footstock, a new little segment that we're going to be doing. And we're going to be discussing, of course, our novelty Info of the Week. So, Mets, um, Forza, Chapel, Chapel Quenza, Quense, however you, you say it, we all know which team we mean, the Brazilian team that unfortunately uh, 76 people died on a plane, including most of that team. Um, it's incredibly tragic news. Um, we've seen some amazing gestures from the world of football. But a good thing that's happened this year in terms of community that FIFA seems to have stepped up on is that um, the way people selling kits for like 5,000 a pop because people wanted them and of course it drives demand and the kits and the badges so FIFA just gave them to everybody which I think is a great thing yeah they've, they've definitely reacted well to this one um obviously rip to to the team and relatives and, and whatnot and all the other people that were involved in it. it's really sad um rip? you know what I mean <laughs> yeah rip rest in peace whatever <laughs> rip, rip in peace <laughs> Anyway, we shouldn't make light of a very serious thing. No, we shouldn't. But in the past, we, we've always had this this kind of plague, if you like, whereby um, people take advantage of real life tragedies in Ultimate Team, like when Chuchu Benitez died and you couldn't buy his IF for less than a ridiculous amount of money. Um, it's happened numerous times. So the fact that people, as soon as something bad happens, they jump on the transfer market and try and and make a killing out of it, no pun intended. Mm. Um, that was a bad choice of words. Um, we, we all mean well, don't we? I mean, you know, we, we, we'll have a laugh and stuff, but we're not actually mocking this whole situation. Why would no, we? That would just... Absolutely not, no. It's, it's a really sad story. You know, a really great up-and-coming team from Brazil that few people outside of South America would have probably heard of, uh, and now they're famous for all the wrong reasons, which is really sad. Um, but EA have stepped in, they saw the market react to the news and they just dropped the hammer on it immediately. So we've all now got a, a Chepaquense kit, whether we use it or not, it's fine, we can't trade them. And that instantly kills the demand in any black market for those kits. So fair play to EA on that one. And they're not actually bad kits. I mean, I don't tend to go for Brazilian league kits ever, I don't think, not for a very long time anyway. But these ones are quite nice. So, and I'm seeing them all over the place. You know, we've had loads of novelty kits come into the game in the last week. We've had unicorn kits, we've had rainbow kits, and now we've got this tribute kit to Chepa Quince. And I see them all the time. Um, so it's not like people, just, people aren't binning them off or just sticking them in the club and forgetting about them. People are, are on board with the message and the solidarity. So well done, EA. Uh, well done for the community for, for getting involved in the right way with that and, and putting an end to the black market on that one. I'm all for you know, a little bit of capitalism within the game and anticipating events and being smart, but 
some people really do take the piss and, and ultimately these aren't things that anyone would have wanted unless something bad had happened so i'm kind of glad ea have taken the course of action that they have done brilliant i think that's um, a great play, place to put it um in, in real news apparently ronaldinho and raquel may have said they'll pay for free for them so i think that's a, a nice gesture um they both deserve legend cards in the next in this fifa i'm sure interesting you say that as well because um if you go to FC Barcelona's official Twitter, they've put out an advert on behalf of Konami today uh, that they've introduced basically the Van Hal era of Barcelona players as, oh, as legends. So you people like Michael Reisiger, Barhan Sergi, Raquel May, and Ronaldinho, who is a bit further down the line, but loads of new additions in there. So that kind of comes on the back of this news about Ronaldinho and Raquel May wanting to get back into the game to help uh, Chepaquense out, which was a marvellous gesture. And I, I really hope it comes true because what a story that would be. I'm sure they both can still run rings around people to a degree. Mm, I'm not sure. So weird that they chose to do that after that news broke, but maybe it's just coincidence. Or maybe not. Who knows? Yes, maybe. Who knows? But. We do need to talk about Black Friday that went all a bit, um, well, it was an absolute banger, I thought. Um, I had a great time. I pulled loads of great cards. And I have to confess, Mets, this isn't news to you, but it's news to our listeners. I spent money on packs. Yeah, so did I. I finally relented. And because the last team of the week for week, 10 was so good i just wanted to try and pack somebody and you know i rinsed through about 100 quids with packs mm. and i got a couple of discard in forms so about as much as i could have expected realistically speaking mm. but those you have to pick your shots quite carefully when you, you go down the real money route with with ultimate team there's some team of the week you shouldn't touch from a barge pole because yes. there's even no good players in there or the players in there that are so good you've got no chance of packing them this was one that had everything at every level there was really good discard is stuff in the middle and stuff right at the top like striker ronaldo for instance and it caused a minor dip in the market but it's recovered remarkably quickly yeah i think it's been quite interesting um it's happened exactly how we expected there was still more of a dip even though last week people say like, oh, the, the crash had happened, they actually hadn't. It still dipped out a little bit, which is a which is a good thing. Obviously, it meant that we could pick up some players for quite cheap. It wasn't just so great for Sal. Um, my star pack of the the weekend was Manuel Neuer. <laughs> I was pretty I was pretty happy with that one. Sadly, yeah, not a player I'm ever going to use. So uh, I sold him immediately. Um, but yeah, Black Friday was fantastic. We had loads of the squad building challenges that they did on the hour and stuff. I got the unicorn uni, uniform, the uh, kits. The unicorn kit's the best kit. Just is by <laughs> miles and miles and miles. Cool. It's freaking amazing. Probably the, the rainbow pink. kit is it clashes with everything. The rainbow kit's awful. I, I just um, it's, um, unicorn can actually sing, single you out. Against the darker kit, so in that respect, it actually works functionally. Yeah, it's, it's it works functionally. It looks good for an EA kit. The problem with the rainbow kit is that, of course, it clashes with many things, and also the back's white. So then, if you've got a white kit versus a rainbow kit, you wouldn't know until you've played it, which is a bit of a um, public service announcement, I suppose. You will actually clash with white kits with the rainbow kit. Yeah, I think EA were bandwagoning on that one, quite frankly. <laughs> Yeah, I think what they what they should have done perhaps is made it a black they, kit with a rainbow you, um, metal. Uh, virtue signaling, I think, is the term you like to use. Um, I don't use it particularly, uh, but yes, it is a signal. It's, it, that's exactly what it is. It's the same. You know, if we're going to talk about it, it frankly, then yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, uh, the Chapo Quincy, it's the same thing. To be honest, it's a uni. It's However, that one has a bit more of a. It's so tragic what's happened, and it's a it's, it's a one-off event where something like this happens. It's like the Busby Babes. I was think that. the difference being with Chappaquinza is they're clearly in touch with the overall mood of the community. So I agree with that. Absolutely. Few people would disagree with doing that. I think if they are the dicks, quite frankly. Whereas, I've got nothing against the LGBT community, but. Why did that have to go in at that particular time? No particular reason for it. That's um, a good point, actually, because Pride's in the summer, isn't it? It's in August and July. 
which you know um you're right. It's strange that it turned up at that point. Um, I've nothing against it, really. I haven't seen many people use it. I just think it's a bad kit. It is a bad kit. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong with giving out a kit for pride. That is not the point we're making, is it? It's the fact that a strange time to give it out. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe there's something that we've missed. Well, there's a lot of football clubs changing their badges on Twitter to to Rainbow. So something was going on, and I'm not fully sure what it was. But why now? And I don't think it's something that they've done in, in FIFA before. It certainly wasn't necessary. Um, but if people like it, no problem. But Chapecoense, they just felt the mood, the general sentiment of the community was was there. And I think most people appreciate it. And they certainly didn't want bad publicity coming up whereby people are profiteering from a tragedy, which you know, people yeah. make videos about it and stuff. And it doesn't look good for anybody concerned. So I think they've, they've made all the right moves there. They're just talking about some of the, the squad building challenges for Black Friday, they they were coming every couple of hours or so for squad builders and then do special packs every hour and stuff. And oh, I didn't get much done at work on Friday, put it that way. I was really, really attached to my phone <laughs> doing squad oh, building God. challenges. Yeah. And, um, and some of them were, were quite difficult to figure out, particularly if you've got a limited squad database. I had over 2,000 players, so it was kind of like, well, where do I start? but most people don't have that available to them. But all in all, really good fun. And I like how EA have their finger close to the pulse this year on stuff like this, and they're more dynamic, more um, reactive to what's going on in real-world events and stuff, and definitely keeping things fresh and, and interested in an Ultimate Team. They are doing a much, much better job. Perhaps that's why things like the Pride kit have come in they're trying to be a lot more overarching and have much more contact with us than they have before so we have to they're going to make not everything they do is going to work out and not everything is going to make a lot of sense uh but overall the actual black friday weekend in terms of its actual quality and what it offered to you it kept you very entertained it and, and, it, and they also had good offers on like rare player packs came out more than once which Thirty shots at rare players. Yes, please. Hmm. Can you imagine how much money they made over all those lightning rounds of you know, multiple millions just in the space of a day? I'm sure because they had uh, global limits on a lot of them, and they all pretty much instantly sold out. So I'm sure you can do the math and work out exactly how much they made. But it would have been a staggering amount of money. I can imagine it has been tremendously successful. But this is what happens when you do the right kind of mix. There's a lot. There's a lot of giving for EA this time rather than just trying to take which I, I I would assume has a direct effect on how much people are willing to give back to them. So of course we get free content and stuff like that. You don't feel as bad about actually spending money on packs. So perhaps we're all being a bit cheat and we're all being um, as daft as our brains like, oh yeah you've been kind to us. I know I'll buy packs. I certainly did. Yeah, I mean I didn't do well off my Black Friday packs, um, particularly when I went for like the thousand FIFA point packs, which were like 100,000 coin packs or whatever. Ooh. And, you know, I came up pretty dry on that one. Um, but uh, I've opened some stuff since. And it's, it's not doing too bad. Like, for instance, I've got my weekend league monthly reward. No, not monthly reward. No, just normal weekend re uh, league reward. And I pulled uh, Van Vossen, who was going for over 50K because people need him to com still complete the hazard challenge. So that was great. So he's going for 50k? He was. Oh, he was going for more than that. When it, when it came out, the card was like over 100k because all the other Belgium informs you were extinct, essentially, or, or massively overpriced. And it's the last day or so to do the, the hazard challenge for it disappears. Oh, right, of course. It's, is it actually is it gone now, the actual hazard challenge? No, at the time of recording this, you've still got about 12 hours or so to do it. So presumably <laughs> we're going to get the new monthly player this weekend, I suspect. And I think the finger on the pulse suggests it's going to be Victor Moses, um, which would be interesting. Uh, not not gets, quite a hazard. Um, he gets a position change, which is fair enough, but... Will he be a right wing back or an RM? It'll be interesting to see how that one works out. If he, if he becomes a right wing back, that'd be quite an interesting card to get. 
But here's the thing about um, <laughs> Sif Saig and all that. We've actually had a very interesting thing happen to one of our dear listeners, Glenn V, who I alluded to earlier. He actually had a pro site and he didn't realise it at the time until we said it on Twitter. But he played against a Premier League footballer's account because he had a blue car that was 95 rated of himself. So Metz, would you like to reveal who this person was? Yeah, so so Glenn Ping is saying, what is this card? I've never seen it before. And because it was so high rated, it was obvious what it was. And he was playing against a uh, whole left back, Andrew Robertson, who's Ooh. Scottish and pretty good player in real life, up and coming uh, full back. And yeah, you don't expect to encounter a 95 rated defender too often. So you're like, what the hell is this? And yeah, uh, I've never played against the professional uh, players like Supercard before. So these are, few, these are few and far between. These are the rarest cars in FIFA, There's a, which we are only one of them in existence and you can't trade it. So the chances of you even coming up against it are, are incredibly slim. Um, so yeah, well done to Glenn. Uh, did, he, did he happen to get a win over Andrew uh, Robertson? He actually did pull a 2-1 win, so well done to Glenn. There you go, sticking it to the pros. Well done, Glenn. That's good stuff. So if any of our viewers out there have played against any pro cards before, let us know um, what the experience of that was like because I fancy giving it a go against a, a professional footballer and then telling them to get wrecked in private messages. Get <laughs> Imagine doing a dab on Pogba. Just don't do a dab to anybody. You just should be banned. <laughs> no, when it comes to um, parts of the game, then we're going to be talking a bit about uh, uh, tactics here. Then one of the big things that the, we've obviously been talking about my custom tactics. For those who are after my custom tactics, I will be publishing it on Twitter within the next twenty-four hours. I am Matt underscore Aguilera, and you, Matt, are at Lambo Matt. Yes, and you can also get in touch with us at Footstock. I'll be publishing it there as well. Um, whether you like it or not is a different issue. Just try it. I'm still using the 412122. Uh, I did try and use 4321, but I don't like it. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> impact, subs, impact subs that we've been using, Mets. I thought well, you, you uh, brought this up because there has been. Well, it's one of those things you need to do in terms of game management. You need to have people that you can bring on that can change the game. And one of my first nominations is not a player, but pace. <laughs> pace in general. Yeah, any yeah. kind of pace, bring it off the bench. So, Mets, give us one of your top shouts. Okay, you. so I think it's important that you can have players who can play a multitude of positions because we're coming up to a feature a little bit. But later on the show where we've been looking at some professional players now they do things and it seems to be the overwhelming opinion is that you should bronze bench but have three really good players to, purely for subs and the rest of the bench can just be bricks as far as they're concerned so if we concentrate on the three that i use as, as examples off the back of this theory um my first one would be conor plianka from shelka because he can play Left mid, right mid, left wing, right wing, even as a striker, 90 plus pace, great passing, great dribbling, great shooting. And I'm playing him as a super sub in a Serie A team at the moment. Oh, right. And every time you bring him on late in the game, providing that you've used the pace in your starting 11 to stretch the opponent out a bit and get them tired, Conor Plianka causes absolute havoc. You know, I've got far better goal and assist records with him as a sub than most of my first teamers, which is really weird. Um, and he's pretty two-footed as well. So because he can play almost everywhere in, in attack, he is an absolutely superb uh, person or candidate to have as a super sub. Um, my other ones would be, I've got Inform Miguel Leun, because again, he's so well-rounded that he can play at every position. So I quite happily bring him on as a CB, a fullback, a midfielder, a winger, maybe even a striker from Desperate that you can do a multitude of jobs very, very well, particularly defensively. You know, he's good going forward, but he's, he's very solid. So anywhere that requires a little bit of extra steel, he is a good one. And, of course, he's, he's reasonably quick as well. Yeah. And then my final one, and this isn't so much of a tactical one, but just 
more for quality. I've got Inform Rafinha from Barcelona, who was position oh, changed. He's position changed from CM to RM for the Inform, which makes him kind of useless in the starting eleven. I mean, he's excellent stats, but you wouldn't want his quality as a wide player. But bringing him on as a super sub again, playing wherever you want, be a good CF, Cam, CM. And he's so good. The dribbling is insane. The finesse shooting is out of this world. Just massive, massive impact on the match. Uh, he has an excellent record for me from coming off the bench for goals and assists. Um, and I don't think he's that expensive, even though he's been out for a few weeks. I reckon could still get him for about 20, 25K. So quite expensive for a super sub. But you know, if we're talking um, money is no object, that would be a great one to get. So how about you, Matt? What? Mm, Leroy Sane is like unbelievably good. So left wing, right wing, he's left footed, so that's always a nice advantage to put. Play him in attacking midfield, you can play him in defensive midfield. I often play him as a full back if I need to replace somebody quickly. He's got high he's got decent physicals, not high physicals, that's a bit of a lie. Um yeah, so he's an incredible all rounder. And he can play him up front, like he's decent enough, and he can he can do it all. Sane can, well worth having. He's not very expensive. Go and buy him. Lovely. The other one would be Marcus Rashford. You'd probably be playing him up front anyway, but he's a wonderful player to bring off the bench because he's so incredibly quick and a really decent finisher. Um, I've scored loads of goals on Marcus Rashford. I quite like him, but not as much now that I've tried him as Jamie Vardy. Jimmy Vardy is quite lovely on this game. And when it comes to somebody that isn't like uh, forward or fast, Fellaini. Fellaini is very, 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 very useful. Um, you can play him as a centre back, defensive midfield, attacking midfield, striker. It's not going to be quick, of course, but it's high physicality can really, really, really do th good things for you. Especially like, for example, if you, you chase your um, willing, you wanted to shut out a game, should I say, and you put him in a defensive position, he's going to play anywhere and be excellent. So yeah, there you go, Fellaini, Rashford, Sane. Mm. The thing I like chance. about Fellaini is, particularly when players have slowed down due to lack of fitness, you can't take the ball anywhere near Fellaini without him grabbing it off you. Mm. It's, it's, not, it's not a question of him leaning on you and taking the ball off you, which he does really well because he's strong, but his grab circle, which is a phrase that we've coined, which is the amount of distance he can stick his leg out and just take the ball is enormous. Yeah, because he's... he's you have to dribble so far away from him to keep the ball, and they can't do it when they're tired, which means he just... It's like having Kante at the beginning of the game, but later in the game, and obviously he's much taller, so you... you you get protection from being long ball by goalkeepers and stuff. You should win most area battles that way. You're going to get increased threat from corners. It's just a really great one that a lot of people overlook because he's only 50 something pace. Yeah, everyone just looks at the pace and doesn't seem that like actually how much of that, how all of his other stats just come into play. So, yeah, great, great stuff. Impact subs. You need to be thinking the ideas of how you can use them. And in terms of your game management, you do need to be bringing them on to. To shore things up or to go and get that goal. So, Max, in terms of uh, th this diagnosis footstop, then we've had a Twitter user come in with the called the John underscore CU. It was looked at some of his teams and said, Can you help us? And you've taken the lead on this one and said, Yes, we can. Yeah, so people aren't aware, John is a co-host of the new podcast called Character Unlock, which is a current and retro gaming or video game podcast. And he's kindly re reached out for us and asked for a little bit of help in just refining some decent squads that he already has, but how can we make them a little bit better? And I'm going to presume that John doesn't have a shitload of coins. So we're going to try and do this for him relatively as cheap as we can. So... I'll put the teams up on the screen so people can see. Um, we'll start with his Serie A team, which is a, a pretty standard 4 free, free affair. And I'd say the back line is pretty solid. Uh, Perrin and goal, a bit of a hipster choice, but he, he is pretty good on this. Right back, Lichsteiner, um, Manolas, Koulibaly, and then left back, Ansaldi. 
Yeah. And Salad is not that good, is he? Really? I would I would start with the full backs here. I think his goalkeeper and centre backs are, are actually really good. Um, left back, you have to have Alexandro in Serie A. He's so good. He's so good at everything, isn't he, Alexandro? I wish I. I wish there was somebody as good as Alexandro who played in the Premier League. He's yeah, me too. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but yeah, he's probably the best fullback I've used on this year's game, I would say. Um, powerful, quick, good at crossing, shooting, passing. Physical presence of a centre back in the left back position means he shuts down a lot of wingers really easily. So I would definitely put Alexandro in there. You're looking between 5 and 6K. A really good investment there. And right back, I'm going for uh, either Bruno Perez or Florenzi. Either of them do just as well as the other. Both less than a thousand coins. God, Bruno Perez is amazing. He's so fast. Yeah, I mean, I personally use Bruno Perez in my current best team, um, but Florenzi is almost as good. It's just a matter of whether you prefer slightly more refined skills in Florenzi or a bit more pace cheese from Perez, but they're both absolutely excellent. Yeah, they're both really, really, really good. Serie A is good like this, though, isn't it, when you get people of uh, uh, the same skill level and they're so bloody cheap. Yeah, absolutely. And the good thing about Florenzi is that if you need a bit of a reshuffle later in the game, you can easily put him in midfield. Yeah, he can play anywhere. He's great. He is like a genuine modern day utility player. He has everything. So wouldn't be any issue if I decided that I wanted to bring on a different right back, but then have another really good midfielder. I can just move up the pitch. So Forenzi, either as a bencher or and you start in eleven's fine. Bruno Perez would be my first choice. Um midfield, this is an interesting one. Yeah. Um, I, I think, think- the Ryan Belia is a defensive midfielder. I just I think he's cack hard. There's only one choice for me, and that's Alan. Um, from yeah, that. Alan, yeah, good shot. Because he's, Alan is ace. he's almost a duplicate of Kante. There's almost nothing in between them whatsoever. It's just Kante's flavour of the month because what he's done with uh, Leicester last year, no one looks at Alan. Discard 600 coins, but. He's almost the exact same player. You'd be absolutely astonished how similar they are if you check him up on Footed. So I would bend Belia off and put in Alan first of all. Um, Historically, I've always been a big fan of Marco Perolo in this, but he's a little bit too clunky for me in in FIFA 17. I've actually found... He's 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 nowhere near the player he was in 16. No, I agree. So... My choice for this one would be someone I've actually discovered quite recently, and it's Daniele Baselli from Torino, central midfielder. Yeah, he's really, really good, and he's discard. He's a really good player. Yeah, another discard. Incredible long-range shooter, and just all around much tidier and slightly more agile than Parolo. So that would be my choice there for the budget-conscious player. And I don't mind uh, Jorginho. He's actually quite well-rounded. Uh, the only problem that you're going to have if you use Alan, Jorginho and Baselli is a slight lack of physical presence in terms of height and, and overall strength. So it's a case of do you go for Jorginho or do you bulk up the midfield with someone like a nine goal one, but that's 40 odd K. Mm. So stick with Jorginho if you're short coins. If you can upgrade to, to nine goal one, that's ideal. And then uh, shall we move on to the front line where... I'm not. There's no. There's no Quadrado, which is a complete tragedy. Yeah. One of the best wingers of the game. Berardi's good, but he's only three star Quadrado. skills. And I think if you want to achieve a high level on this game, you need to have as much skill in your forward line as possible. So he's an excellent finisher, Berardi. You might even want to put him as an RF and use him as a striker, and that would probably work really well. But I would mm. prefer someone like Quadrado or even Callihan as the right winger. Well, Salah, Salah, Salah. Yeah, Salah's excellent on this. That's another really good shout. So either of those three would be fine. Left winger, El Shirari is the finesse machine. You know, he's a really great uh, finesse finisher, but he's a little, oh, bit, a little bit too slow. You're not going to stretch the team on the counter-attack with El Shirari. So for me, it's either Insigne or Mertens, both of which you can get pretty cheap now if you can afford the inform Insignia, that's great as well. Um, but if you're on a budget, 
personally, I would go for Mertens. I think he's a, the absolute ideal candidate for that position. Okay. And so how do you feel about Backer then? Because when it comes to Backer, uh, I've taken a look at him a few times and I was going with the Serie A team and I've always thought that he'd be really good at the right kind of card. Yeah, I've not actually used him, so I can't say categorically whether I think Backer's great or not, but he's much better on this version than he has been in previous years. So I can't honestly say. I can tell you who I use and works really well. And that would be like an inform Kalinic, the inform Immobile, or who was the guy from Torino who we picked last week? Oh, Bellotti. Yeah, again, really good. Any of those is fine. Um, I can't say categorically, hand on heart, if they're better than Backer or not, because I've not used Backer. But um, if you're scoring goals, don't keep him. If you're not, then change him up to somebody else who suits your style of play a little bit better. The one thing you're, you're short of, in Serie unless you've got lots of coin, is a real goal threat from pace. But I have used uh, Muriel, and he's essentially what Serie A's closest answer to Rashford. You know, he's very, or maybe even Musa, uh, very similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly slower, but devastating pace and dribbling, which just makes him really awkward if he starts running at centre-backs. He can sort of pull you all over the places with good dribbling. So that's probably something to have a look at there. And we'll just skim over his other teams because we've, we've taken quite a bit of time on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really have any issues with his uh, French team, to be honest. Um, that all looks pretty solid. I might change Fakir on the right wing for, for someone a little bit quicker. But mm -hmm. if you can play well with a slower but very high dribbling winger, then fair play to you. He's kind of like this year's Ben Arthur in terms of that he's not the type of winger that's going to blow you away with pace, but if he gets you on the wrong foot, he's going to leave you on your arse, basically. So not much wrong with that. That all looks really good to me. Um, and then the Premier League team, there are a few little issues here. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of Carrius as the keeper. I'd rather have Butwunder from going for a sort of budget goalie. Me too. Um, right back, I think you have to have Walker or Bellerin, just because the pace is just absolutely monstrous. Um, Coleman's a nice all-rounder, but you will leave yourself slightly vulnerable to counters because he's not that quick. So I would I would move him out. I like don't mind the centre back pairing. The Tongan and Mustafi are good. Yeah, uh, they are. Not a fan of Danny Rose on this at all. Um, doesn't no, play no, doesn't play like an eighty rated card for me. The thing is though, he's got catalyst on him, so that makes him very quick. It makes takes him to the nineties. That does. Yeah, I would sooner have uh, your favourite Masuaku or Luke Shaw, possibly, just because he, he's a lot more robust and powerful. It's almost like having a centre-back playing in the left-back position, but a bit quicker. I'll have to try with Luke Shaw, but I've been using Leighton Baines, who I think is phenomenal. Yeah, he's always got on this. Yeah, I mean, he's got 75 pace, but with a cat, this card becomes unstoppable. One of the bigger issues here is that Emre Chan's at defence in the field, which is like... Yeah, I definitely wouldn't be doing that. You pretty much have to have Kante to remain competitive, whether it's in CM or CDM. You take your take your choice on that one. But I, out of the selection that we have here, I would move Can to CM, bin off Sigurdsson. Um, yeah, definitely. In a better CDM. I actually really like Herrera on this, so no yeah, problem. Yeah, Herrera's good. Herrera is very good, in fact, actually, I'd say. Uh, the problem you've got with... So Gertsen is that as a CAM or CF, he's very good uh, like that, but he's got nothing else to offer, really. Yeah, he's all about finishing. You know, he's got a striker's finishing ability, so he offers nothing in the middle of the park, and the pace um, does clutter up the midfield a little bit there. Um, he's not going to get up and down the pitch quickly enough, so I would bin off Sigurdsson, put Can in the CM role, and then get a better CDM, ideally Kante, maybe even a Fellaini. Yeah, maybe. Fellaini actually would be very good. I use Fellaini or Wan Yama as a defensive midfielder. Um, I use Kanti a little bit further up the pitch most of the time, if I'm honest with you, which is a very popular choice. But I love Wan Yama, so there you go. There you go. Wan Yama has a good shout. And the forward line is interesting. I like Shakiri on this a lot, but he's not quick enough to blow people away with pace. So you have to be really good at dribbling to get the most out of him, and you have to finish shoot on his left foot. If you can't do that, you're better off having somebody else who's a bit more direct, whether it's Walcott, 
Oxlade Chamberlain, Gillafeu, someone like that. Um, but if you're good at dribbling and can bring them in on the strong foot for a shot, great. Uh, you really like Bashuai. I think Bachelet is absolutely amazing. Um, stick on to him, and he's, he is literally completely monstrous. Yep, so he's... that's going to cost you, let's say, 2 to 3k. Ideally, if you can buy a Bachelet that's already got Hunter on it, that might save you some money. And then th- this is the bit that, that pains me as a Stoke fan a little bit, is yeah. uh, Marco on how to finish. He's not quick enough uh, to be a left winger. Um who would you recommend for left wing from the Premier League? Do we use wingers anymore? Do this. That's the, that's the point. Um, Walcott's a left winger now. He's far more useful because um, he's incredibly fast. His agility is really, really good. And who else would I recommend? Definitely well, not I, in an ideal world, you'd have Hazard, but not everyone. No, uh, if, yeah. if, if money's an issue... Uh, Buffal from Southampton's pretty nice uh, on this. Uh, I think he's shite on him. I really didn't get on with him. Uh, who else? God, I don't use wingers anymore, so he really put me on the spot. Mm. Oh, Walcott's left wing on this now, so... Yeah, I, I've been using... Oh, of course! To go to, yeah. Janet Balassi. He's like a hundred times better than Arnautovic. And he's about a thousand coins these days, I'm sure. Balassi's not expensive at all. There you Janet go. Balassi, five to hot skills, strong, quick... What more do you want? Finishing an open. Absolutely nothing. So there you go. I hope that helps you out, John. Let us know how you get on with those recommendations and if any of those changes make your final teams. Um, if you've got any squad building conundrums that you'd like us to have a look at, hit us up on Twitter and we can try and fit that into a future show for you. That's Brilliant. All good stuff. What's next on the agenda, Matt? Well, you need to talk about this Mesa fella. This is the, this is your domain because you sat down, you give him a tickle. No, not really. You just watched him on Twitch and uh, you found it quite fascinating because he's a top 100 player and you learned loads. And it wasn't to play a 4 one 2, one, two with wide defence possession, was it? No. Um, I'll give you a little bit of context into this. So, um, qualified for the weekend league last week using the narrow tactics that we've been talking about in, in previous episodes. And just found myself getting absolutely smashed in the weekend league. I was really upset, for lack of a better word, because I, I felt that I wasn't competitive in any of the games I was playing, despite dominating possession, which is what being narrow is all about. It, it will almost certainly guarantee you possession most of the time. Um, but yeah, I went on like a, a nine-game losing run right at the beginning, so I was really up against it. So let's say I'm like 9-0 down games-wise mm. from my first few that I played. And I was like, I need to, to make a change. So I um, can't remember what I referred to. I think I went five at the back, and that started improving um, my results a little bit, but not enough to, to sort of turn it around. So at that point, I was kind of like, right, I think I'm done with the weekend league now. Um, I'm just not getting any enjoyment out of it whatsoever. And then I don't know why I did it, but I just decided to check who was playing on Twitch. I was like, let's see if I can get a little bit of inspiration from somebody. And I didn't realize this guy was a top 100 player until I started watching him for a while. So the guy's name is uh, Mirza Fahir. He's a a Bosnian German and professional gamer. And he was playing his weekend league campaign. I I started watching him on Saturday, so it was about halfway through. And he was just absolutely dominating people. And I've got his team on the screen now. And it is a really good team but it's not out of reach for people who, who put a lot of time into this game. People could have that team. Uh, and there's some spots in the team that are, are like, really, you are only using Luke Shaw at left back? That's a 600-coin player. Oh, yeah, but, but on the other hand, he has got Hazard, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Beckham up front, you know. Yes, but anyway, so I'll, I'll just get into the sort of meat and bones of it. So he was playing 4 3 3 number four, which is the one with two CMs and a cam. Um, although his starting line suggests something else, he changes it around almost as soon as the game starts. So he's just starting it that way for the benefits of chemistry and then starts moving players around in the game. And the um, best way I can des- describe it was uh, heavy metal football, as Jurgen Klopp 
referred to as Dortmund team once. It was constant attack, super aggressive, closing people down, didn't mind burning out the stamina of his players whatsoever. Um, and he was just absolutely crushing people. And I dare say, and this is not being disrespectful, I didn't think he was actually playing that well. Like there were spots where I thought you should have done that differently. And who am I to talk? I'm not a top 100 player. But you could see that, that it wasn't necessarily his ability at the game that was winning the matches. He got his tactics spot on and his team selection was perfect for what he was trying to do. So I'm like, okay, I'm kind of inspired by this. I'm going to give it a try. So I came up with something vaguely similar, but with Serie A players. So basically two rapid wingers with good finishing and a good all-round central striker. You know, in an ideal world, I could use my Crespo, but in the last weekend league, uh, the, the qualifiers for the weekend league, you couldn't uh, put a legend in. It had to be all from the same uh, league. So I had to use a Serie A striker. So I used the, the, the Torino striker we were referring to. Oh, Bellotti. Bellotti, yeah. And worked really well. Um, so th the point of this is, that he absolutely ran his wingers into the ground to close people down, um, which is something I didn't think would work well in this. I thought, basically, don't even try and tackle until they cross the halfway line because you just mm -hmm. won't, won't get to him. But he was just putting so much pressure on people and they were like gifting him mistakes because they just didn't like being hounded so much. So you've got to actually work hard when you don't have the ball and be prepared to, to sacrifice these wingers. So... It was quite common by half time. He, he, he always wanted to have maximum stamina in the front three. So he would drop Ronaldo into Cam and then put on another three forwards. Um, so sacrificing like Bale and Hazard uh, and putting people like Marne in. And it's just, like, just to keep it quick and aggressive up top. And it just worked. I was like, wow, this is really. That's very interesting. I'll, I'll... I do like the idea of it. Pressure is one of those things that's incredibly hard to play against. Incredibly hard. Yeah. So if I don't know if he was actually using high pressure as a tactic because it was in German, I couldn't read what he was doing, but he was meddling from the kickoff with uh, individual commands and stuff. So I'm going to presume he had them all on aggressive um, interceptions and stuff like that because he really was running his team into the ground. But conversely, in order to be competitive against play like that you ha kind of have to do the same so it's it's kind of like holding a, a gun to each other's head and see who comes out off best i'm sacrificing mm. my team and you're going to have to sacrifice yours but i think i'm better so i will come out on top of that one and he did he went 40 you know really you know 40 you know i watched his final game and he was like almost in tears not because he's like i didn't expect to do really well but he was just so grateful that he didn't get any disconnect bullshit he didn't get any dodgy goals against him anything like everything just went really smooth didn't have that much trouble didn't go to extra time or anything in his last few games he just tactically smashed people and this is what I would recommend people try and do. If you go, like, I'm not very good at the weekend league or I'm just struggling for results in general, just give this a try and see how you get on. But basically you need loads of pace in your fullbacks, um, really good, strong box-to-box -box CMs, one very dangerous goal threat as a can, a good all-round striker and two fast and good finishing wingers. And you'll probably be able to emulate his success, at least to a degree. You should see an upturn upturn rather in your form if you're able to, to sort of play his system but uh, yeah I really enjoyed watching him and my results since I've changed to a replica of his system or, or at least something close to it has been absolutely massive and just basically I, I'm not like scared of playing against like foot founders or people really all the more it's just like if I play to my strengths I fancy my chances quite frankly Right. Okay. I've been doing I'm not saying I've not lost again. Of course I have, but I'm winning way more. I've won three weekendly qualified tournaments this week, whereas in previous weeks I've really struggled to win one. So um, the acid test will be for me to put it into this weekend's weekend league and see how I get on. Um, I would expect to do a lot better than I have done, which last week was silver one. Um, I played 32 games and almost brought it back to sort of even win loss after a really bad start but um, I'm looking forward to giving this a go on this weekend where you can see how I come out but I think it'll be fine to be honest I think I'll I'll get the kind of results I've always been expecting now I think I've found ha the niche that works for me there isn't like a universal system that will work for everybody 
that I think this one works for me. Okay, so in a nutshell, then to just round it up, what do you do with the system then? Like, what is the, the what is the main signature of it, and what things do you tend to do now you've seen me as a do what he does? Um, don't fanny around with possession. Just always go forward. Try and stretch people as much as possible. Get them chasing you, and get them to make mistakes. So if you get to let's say you're on the run with your wingers and you get to the other end and you can't see an obvious move, then obviously bring the ball into the middle and start dinging it around and try and get them to put their defenders out of position like you would do in a narrow formation anyway. Yeah. But if you've got most of the best players in Ultimate Team are wingers, and if yes. you're not using them super aggressively, super confidently, you're not getting the best value out of them. So using them to keep the ball and fanny around on their own half it's not good enough. Just run, run to the other end, whether it's cutting inside or going wide, just create chaos and just make sure that there's a good trade off for the, the loss of stamina that you incur for making those runs and what he has to suffer from chasing your place. Because typically they don't just chase you down with one player. They have to chase you down with two. So yeah. you're sacrificing one of your players for two of theirs. It's like chess. And that's basically it. By doing that, you're causing chaos at the other end and forcing them to move people out of position and make mistakes. And that's essentially what he did. All right, I'm going to have to still, I'm still very curious about more of the system right now to go and try it yourself. Um, you say you run forward and all that kind of thing. Just be direct, just very positive, direct play. Okay, so the biggest thing that happens with that then is loss, loss of possession is what I'm thinking in mind if you're not very good. So how are, how are you using the directness and not losing possession? Talk me through that bit. That's the bit I'm most interested in. Mm. Well, I think it's key that you have to be confident in your defending. Um, I've always been quite good at defending in FIFA. That's never been the issue, including this season. I've never conceded many goals. So the fact that I'm confident about counteracting pace with, with decent defensive coverage that's not a concern for me. And I think you have to play with the mentality that if I play well, I will score more goals than this person and not worry about, well, if I go forward, I might get counted. Well, that's you pretty much beaten straight away if you think like that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Particularly at the top level. You know, people, people are prepared to sacrifice the odd goal to score several goals. That's basically it. Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing how you get on the weekend leave then. Hopefully yeah, you can before I come back crying next week. <laughs> but then we need to talk about, it's that time, to talk about our novelty in form of the week. So Mets, um, we both said the same person this week for the inform. But of course, what would it be without me saying that it's been your choice? <laughs> and then of course, being told about this choice in the form of Strictise. How about a Malteser, anyway? Yeah, Malteser sounds lovely. So, Team of the Week 10, probably the best one uh, of the season. There's, there's loads of choices we could have done either at the top end of Informs or in the novelty niche of the market. But we both come to the agreement that there's one in particular that deserves our attention. And I'll give a couple of honourable mentions first, Ooh. if I may. Um we got. I initially got very excited over Artem Juba because he was my go-to striker in the first few weeks of the game, and the inform is monstrous. Ninety-nine heading, ninety-seven strength, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just a monstrous target man. But that's not the most positive way to play FIFA. In contrary to what I just mentioned about uh, the top one hundred guy I was watching, so that ain't going to work. So. The other one that was really good, and I'm sure people saw a lot of if they were opening packs this weekend and doing those squad builders that guaranteed you an inform, they would have probably seen Diego Buonote over and over oh, again. Yes. And thought, well, that's a bit shit. Uh, and it doesn't look that impressive on the, the card stats itself. But if you break it down and look on Foothead, the guy would, this would be an excellent uh, impact sub. Um, not so much first teamer because you couldn't put him in a good team because he plays in the Chilean league, which is unusual for a 81 rated Argentine cam. But 
reasonable pace at 80. 88 long shots and 97 agility with 99 balance. And he's only five foot three. So you can imagine how difficult to play against he is. He's going to turn players inside out of how quickly he can change direction. So if you have pulled a Diego Buonotte and thought, this is a load of shit, I would, You're wrong. <laughs> I would encourage you to give it a go. It's a really good card. Um, but that's not our novelty in form of the week. We've gone for an English striker who plays Whoa. for Sunderland. Oh, and, and he's only 33 years young. Oh, is it? Is it um, Connor Wickham? Uh, no, he plays Crystal Palace, mate. It is Jermaine. <laughs> it's Jermaine Defoe, and oh, there what he a is. welcome addition this card is. And Matt, you're the biggest advocate of, of Defoe. Why don't you break it down for us? What do you like about this card? Um, his agility and balance are amazingly high. For player invisibility, he's in the high 80s and then the low 90s for agility and balance, respectively. And if you put Hunter or Catalyst on him, he becomes a player with 96 acceleration, 89 sprinting, and he's also his finishing is all top notch. If you put Hunter on, he tops out everything basically. He becomes a 99, 99, 99, 99, 5. So that's positioning, finishing shot power and long shots and volleys everything just becomes amazing he is ridiculously good he is like jimmy vardy but a lot more nimble and he's always been a little bit nimble anyway hasn't he jimmy Defoe? but you've got all of these finishing ability with the extra pace i tend to use them with a catalyst card that's because catalyst cards are dead cheap now and you get all the pace boost but also i get the passing boost which of course using my probably now defunct possession system <laughs> After hearing about um, Mirzi Yahich's uh, fortunes, um, obviously I value passing. But yeah, what an, an absolutely, what an absolute joy it has been to use him. His finishing is completely out of this world. Couple with the pace and his agility, it's nuts. He's been my favourite in form for a long, long time. I love him. I've been, um, I came up against him in the weekend league during my bad run and someone scored six goals against me with him he is that good and what he was doing was um i wouldn't say it was target man play but you're always going to have these situations whereby you play a pass into a striker and they're being very tightly marked by very strong center backs that you come up against in the weekend league uh, but what Defoe can do, rather than hold the ball up is he can receive the ball to feet and then turn really quickly and snap a shot off really really fast so his ability to, to just jive and shoot immediately, snapping shots off, is so dangerous. And because he's got incredible shot power and finishing, if you get him within 20-odd yards, it's almost guaranteed a goal every time. And he's got four-star weak foot as well, so even on the left peg, you would fancy yes, scoring, very good. You'd fancy scoring most of the time. And I can't argue... With what you said about Hunter, it does seem to make him the complete package. Um, so again, he's not quite discard, but he's certainly not very expensive. And I think as the season goes on, this card's going to become very popular. Uh, YouTubers will do videos on him. The price will go up. He's an absolute monster. Um, I think he would work better than someone like Vardy or Rashford in a 4 free free type of variant because he can do more as a as a solo striker, um, whereas Vardy and Rashford work better in a two-up top, I think. Yeah, I mean, Vardy's not that bad, actually. I think uh, Vardy's got a lot to offer you, but the thing you, you're missing out on with Defer is his um, relative physicality and also the fact he is quite small. It's the smallness that makes it work, though, because when you combine yeah, yeah. the lack of height with enormous agility and balance, um, you can just roll people really easily, like that situation I just described. So uh, I don't see his lack of, of physicality as, as a weakness. Um, if you're not going to be a, you know, a 90 plus strength powerhouse, you might as well be a midget. I think we've, we've covered this before in previous episodes. Yeah, yeah, middling players who are six foot and you know, a little bit strong, but not really strong. Kind of worthless in this yeah, game, yeah. I think. I would rather have a short arse who can, who, who can bounce all over the place, or Zlatan, exactly. Um, so in that respect, get Zlatan and Defoe and have the ultimate strike force. 
Agreed. I love it. Wonderful. Go out and buy yourself, Jermaine Defoe. It'll be a great kindness to everybody. And to round up this, obviously, uh, we can't say goodbye without saying to Chapel Quince, Forza Chapel Quince. I think it's been a great thing about the FIFA community this week. Um, great to see you all wearing the kits and the badges. But with that, Max, that's the end of another episode. It is. It went in- incredibly quickly and a bit like my sex life. And I'd like to thank you for coming along. This tradition has been stayed to you. Thank you. The comment felt really nice this week after a bit of Black Friday expenditure. I managed to pleasure myself for free for a change. And then, next, it's time for you to see us out of your patented yet so and goodbye. And as folks, thanks for tuning in. Hope you uh, enjoyed the show. And of course, we'll catch you again next week. But in the meantime, don't have nightmares. Thank you. Bye-bye.